public integrity. From wherever you might be joining us, welcome. I am joining you from the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also want to acknowledge as we embark on a conversation about delegated legislation, one instrument of governance, that Indigenous models of governance are the world's oldest surviving models. We're very fortunate this evening to be joined by two eminent panellists, Sir Jonathan Jones and Professor Gabrielle Appleby, who will be talking about the need for delegated legislation reform using COVID, Brexit and spending as case studies. This is a very timely and critically important conversation. For most of the past two years, governments around Australia and indeed in other jurisdictions have been using delegated legislation to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. The India travel ban, Victoria's curfew, indeed all Victorian public health directions in other states also, as well as last year's $40 billion advance to the finance minister were all the result of delegated legislation or were exempt from disallowance, as well as from the, the jurisdiction of the relevant delegated legislation scrutiny committees. Research by the centre has found that the annual volume of delegated legislation made at a federal level has ballooned, indeed basically doubled since the 1980s, with policy decisions affecting people's rights and obligations increasingly being made via delegated legislation and in the absence of adequate parliamentary oversight. None of this is to say that delegation of lawmaking is never justified or necessary. However, where we see a dramatic increase in significant issues of policy being determined by delegated legislation, and that is coinciding with decreased parliamentary oversight, we have cause for real concern. But what can we do about it? To help us navigate these complex issues, Sir Jonathan Jones has very kindly joined us at what is a not so kind hour in the UK. Jonathan held the post of Treasury Solicitor and Permanent Secretary of the Government Legal Department between 2014 and 2020. That is the most senior legal official in the UK government. In over 30 years with the UK government, Jonathan's previous roles included posts in the Home Office, the Attorney General's Office, the Treasury and the Education Department. His practice spanned many areas of administrative, constitutional, international and European Union law, including both primary and secondary legislation. Jonathan is now a senior consultant in public and constitutional law with Linklaters. He is also an honorary professor at the Law School of Durham University and a barrister and a bencher of Middle Temple. He's an honorary QC and was knighted in 2020. Jonathan, thank you. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to join you. I feel I'm having all the excitement of an international conference, including the jet lag, without actually having to travel. Um, but it's very good to join you. And um, you're absolutely right, Catherine. The, the issues that you've identified are very live ones in the UK. Perhaps I should say, first of all, that I was in post in government until about a year ago. So I was uh, there during um, certainly much of the uh, pre-Brexit era uh, and at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. So I saw it firsthand uh, the response of government and was involved in it to those two particular uh, exceptional demands on the UK uh, constitutional system. Um, and of course, I will draw on my experience in government um, subject to the usual professional proprieties. Um, but now I'm slightly freer to comment. And I have been commenting on these issues. Um, and it's very interesting to see that we share some of the same concerns. And um, just to set the scene a bit, um, and uh, this will be very familiar to, to, to many of you, but just to be clear um, about the UK system, um, which of course is the one I'm familiar with, um, the use of secondary or subordinate legislation is very common here in our system as it is in yours, I think. So this is, this is where, as people will know, ministers make law in the form usually of regulations contained in a statutory instrument or an SI under powers conferred by parliament in an earlier act. And we call it secondary legislation by distinction with primary legislation, which is the act of parliament themselves. 
Um, so this is a very normal form of lawmaking, and in many ways it's perfectly appropriate uh, as a way of uh, dealing with relatively detailed, minor, subsidiary aspects of legislation, uh, which may be too detailed or too technical uh, to warrant taking up parliamentary time, or which may need to be frequently updated in future without needing a new bill, without needing a new Act of Parliament every time. Um, and it is easy to see why governments, ministers like this form of lawmaking, because it's convenient to them, it gives powers to the executive that are typically exercisable much more quickly and easily than having to get a new act, a new act of parliament every time. Uh, and there's nothing, as I say, unusual or inherently wrong or constitutional about this. It's an established system of our lawmaking. Um, and under our constitution, with, with parliamentary sovereignty at its core, uh, parliament can confer such powers on ministers, subject to whatever conditions or limitations of procedures that we should to impose. And then ministers uh, can quite properly, of course, exercise those powers subject to review by the courts. Um, the question is, has all this gone too far? And I think it has. And uh, I think as we've heard and will hear a number of other commentators and indeed parliamentarians agree. And both Brexit in the UK and COVID-19 pandemic have thrown new light on this issue. Um, they've certainly seen the government making greater use of secondary legislation. So um, in the case of Brexit, there are many, many other dimensions to Brexit, as you will appreciate. But one of them um, was the necessity to make major changes to UK law to ensure that the pre-existing body of EU law, which we had inherited and incorporated into uh, UK domestic law throughout our period of membership of the EU, we needed to make sure that that pre-existing body of EU law worked in the UK once we had left the EU. And that involved taking powers uh, for good reason, and I, I, I was in post at the time, so I'm implicated in this, uh, for good reason, many of those changes were made through secondary legislation. And that amounted to well over 600 statutory instruments. And, and many of those changes were technical and minor, but others were much more substantial. So I may come back to Brexit um, and, and why it was necessary to legislate in that way. But secondly, the pandemic, um, Again, uh, emergency powers were taken, and in fact, there were already emergency public health powers on the statute book in the UK, and those powers were used for understandable reasons. In the case of COVID, to make over 500 statutory instruments. And of course, um, the measures contained in those instruments uh, imposed lockdowns, travel restrictions, closure of businesses, all the kinds of controls we've seen in, in many countries across the world, the most intrusive restrictions on all aspects of national life that we have seen in modern time, made by secondary legislation. And while, uh, as Catherine says, exceptional circumstances may have justified exceptional measures, this recent use of secondary legislation raises important questions about the quality of the law, as well as its intelligibility, its clarity, its accessibility and its democratic legitimacy. And the main problems I suggest have been ones of timing, the speed with which this is typically being done, and the lack of, of the opportunity for proper consideration by Parliament. So on timing, repeatedly we've seen instruments made only a couple of days or sometimes even hours before they come into force. And this may have been avoidable at the height of the emergency, but, but it's still been happening until recent weeks. As further amendments are made, we still have some of these measures in force and they're being relaxed or adjusted. And very often that is still happening at very short notice. But it does not lead to good lawmaking. It sort of feels rather obvious to say that policy developed at speed and finalized at the last minute with a minimal consultation 
even inside government, let alone outside, it will tend to be worse policy, less well thought through, more inconsistent, more prone to unintended gaps and anomalies. I'll come back to the question of mistakes, but, but very often we have seen mistakes, uh, which then require the law to be changed again. And very often that happens, has to happen quickly. Um, so this legislating at speed will tend to produce simply bad law. It can also lead bluntly to, to poor drafting. And I used to draft statutory instruments myself um, and it's tough at the best of times. Um, but when this is done in a hurry with minimal time for checking, um, the, the chances are you will end up with mistakes. And this is what has happened. Uh, we've seen an increased rate of omissions and technical mistakes. Uh, uh, including examples of ministers signing the wrong version of the instrument. These are human errors that can happen when things are done in a hurry. Um, and again, at the risk of being slightly cruel to the, to the drafters who have my sympathy, very often when things are done in a rush, even if they're technically correct, legislation drafted in a hurry can be difficult to follow simply because uh, the draft may have to have been put together in, in, a, in a clunky way um, and there has not been time to devise the, the more elegant uh, drafting solution. So those are the downsides of legislating in a hurry. Um, uh, lack of scrutiny is a connected problem. Um, now under our system, even in ordinary times, the opportunity for scrutiny by parliament is limited Secondary legislation cannot be amended by Parliament. The most that can happen is that it's debated. Um, debates are required for a minority of instruments, so-called affirmative instruments. Um, most instruments are subject to the negative procedure, which means they only get debated um, in very exceptional circumstances, um, and that's very rare. Um, so actual debates are rare, amendment is impossible, but on the other hand, uh, valuable scrutiny work is done in the specialist parliamentary committees, and where that is done in advance of an instrument being made, which can happen where there is time, then there is an opportunity for corrections or improvements before the instrument comes into force. And we have a so-called rule, the 21-day rule, which is a rule of pra parliamentary practice rather than law, which requires that negative instruments must normally be laid before Parliament at least 21 days before they come into force. And that is a very useful discipline. It at least gives Parliament, particularly the specialist committees, but also the wider public, the opportunity to consider the legislation and where relevant, prepare to comply with it a reasonable period before it comes into force. Uh, and that publicity and even the possibility of a debate in which ministers might be required to justify the content of an instrument, uh, even if that's in practice relatively rare, that is an incentive towards better, more transparent lawmaking. Um, so that 21 day rule is an important discipline, but in practice, it has been very often disregarded. Um, the government's approach to legislating for Brexit and COVID has seen this limited level of parliamentary involvement reduced yet further, in many instances to zero. So many Brexit and COVID statutory instruments received almost no parliamentary scrutiny. Of the 500 plus COVID instruments, only about 30 were debated in parliament before coming into force. Of those subject to the negative procedure, uh, I won't bore you with too many figures, but something like 55% of those over half obviously breached the 21 day rule. So they weren't even published or laid before parliament uh, for that period before coming into force. And it follows that parliamentarians, MPs and here peers in the House of Lords will have had little or no involvement in the creation of these laws, some of the most important laws affecting the country. Um, so that's the problem with scrutiny. This then leads into, I would suggest, problems of compliance or even just comprehension in the law. 
So if law is being made at the last minute, it means that the legislation is not available to those affected by it, whether they be businesses or schools or individual members of the public, or indeed their legal advisors, um, in time for them to understand it and prepare for it and comply with it. Uh, and I know this from my own experience, obviously I have friends and colleagues who run businesses and do work in schools, and we saw time after time, particularly during the pandemic, uh, a change in the law might be foreshadowed by a ministerial announcement or just frankly by gossip, um, but the text of the law would not be available until say the day before, and this is hopeless for citizens and businesses who have to prepare to comply with it. And the same goes for the police and others responsible for enforcing the law. Um, so again, they may know that a change in the law is coming along and it will be their job to enforce it. But the detail, which is what matters, particularly if you're talking about the criminal law, the detail may not be available until very shortly beforehand. And this contributed to confusion about what the law says and inconsistency in its enforcement, as well as leading to failed prosecutions. So we had prosecutions based on misreading of the law, misunderstanding of the law, and then they, of course, failed. And that does no good to the reputation of the law or the rule of law. And part of the problem has been a blurring of the line between guidance and the law. That's another issue. I don't have time to go into that. I don't know if that's a problem you've seen in Australia, but connected with the problems I've told about timing and lack of clarity, we had different bodies, government, police forces, and so on, producing guidance on the law, which very often was either wrong or went beyond what the law actually said. And that too con contributed to confusion. So um, that's the problem, I think, that we've had rushed, poorly scrutinized legislation, which is likely to result in bad law. Uh, if law is published late, it's difficult to follow or is, is just simply inaccessible then that's a problem for those who have to comply with it, as well as those whose job it is to enforce it. And legislation produced in this way is likely to lack democratic legitimacy. If the politicians who represent us will have had little or no say in it or stake in it. So I think this has been um, damaging, frankly, to public confidence in the law and in lawmaking. Um, uh, the risk, there is a risk, I think, that this approach to lawmaking becomes a habit because it is quite convenient to the executive, um, uh, particularly if you have an executive, as something I think we do here, that is not particularly keen on scrutiny anyway, uh, to, to be able to govern in this way is quite convenient. Uh, and we have seen signs that this may become a habit. Uh, the government's talked about plans for reviewing retained EU law. I've mentioned this, this body of EU law on the UK statute book, um, which really is there as a kind of holding position until the government post-Brexit takes policy decisions about what it wants to do. Now we're outside the EU and the government has said that it's looking at the possibility of fast track mechanisms for doing this. And this rings an alarm bell with me because it suggests that the fast track mechanism will be one again that uh, has a minimal role for um, for Parliament or otherwise just involves doing things very quickly. Um, so I think this could become a wider problem. Um, I've suggested that therefore the time is right for a kind of reset of uh, the use of secondary legislation, which might include any of the following um, tighter scrutiny of the scope of powers in the first place. So what are these powers that, that parliaments are granting to the executive? Are they too wide? Should there be some constraints on them? Um, we need to look again at the types of parliamentary procedure which should apply. But even if you've granted a wide power, should you subject that power to greater scrutiny, requiring debates and so on and votes in a way that, as I've said at the moment, is the exception rather than the rule. Should we change the, change the position so that certain kinds of SIs are in fact amendable? As I say, that's not the position here for any kinds of statutory instrument. But I think there is a case for saying that certain 
of the more serious uh, statutory instruments should not require not only a, a, a vote and debate, but should be capable of being amended by Parliament. That would be a big change. I think we should look at it. Um, we should certainly uh, tighten up the provisions on timing, the, the, the gap between the making of an instrument and its coming into force. I think uh, the idea that that can be a matter of hours, which is certainly we have seen during the pandemic, should be confined to the gravest and most pressing of emergencies. So we should certainly define the rules around timing. And we should look again at the protocols around publication. These things are all linked. But again, if instruments are going to come into force very quickly, it should be absolutely clear where the text can be found. We should not have to hunt around the internet or different government websites to find the text of the law a matter of hours before it comes into force. And I think it's also worth looking at uh, the a requirement or at least a, a, a default position that where an instrument amends previous legislation, the government should publish a consolidated version of the law as amended. I think that would greatly aid transparency and com comprehensibility of the law, particularly where you've got very complex changes being made at short notice. So I will wind up, but I what I want to conclude by saying is that, um, as I started, these issues are common, I think, now to a number of jurisdictions. And although um, it may not be in the immediate best interests of the government, um, the government here certainly, to change a system that works in a sense perfectly well for it, there are now a number of voices raising these wider concerns about the rule of law and the accessibility and the quality of the law. Um, a number of parliamentary committees here have done this. Uh, there are a number of think tanks and, um, and uh, research bodies here that are onto it, including the Hansar Society, which is an important research body, an independent body on legislative and parliament affairs. It's launched its own review of delegated legislation and, and I'm associated with that. Uh, but that also includes, I think this is important, a number of MPs and members of the House of Lords. So you have parliamentarians here who I think are themselves rightly concerned about the extent to which their role, the role of scrutinising legislation, holding the government to account, being truly accountable to their constituency, to their constituents, that their position has itself been undermined by the excessive use of delegated powers. Um, so I think we will see more about this. Uh, there will be public events, the Hansar Society is going to hold public events to look at these things. Um, so um, the, the suggestions I've made are just that, they are suggestions, they're not a blueprint. But I, I think this is a live conversation and I look forward to hearing any further ideas that come from, from your jurisdiction in the course of this event. So I'll, I will close there, um, but obviously happy to join in the discussion later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jonathan. You know, we see the same problems here as what you've been describing. And you know, from personal experience, I know I've certainly been one of the people scrounging around on the internet, trying to find the law, distinguish it from the guidance just hours before it comes into force. And it's certainly not at all easy. Uh, and that's, of course, why hearing your insights into areas of, of reform is so valuable, because as you point out, there is a real fear that this kind of lawmaking might become a habit, particularly for governments which, which prefer to avoid scrutiny. I would next like to introduce Professor Gabriel Appleby. Gabriel has worked at the Faculty of Law and Justice at the University of New South Wales since 2015. She researches and teaches in public law, focusing on the accountability of public power as exercised by the government, the parliament and the judiciary. Drawing on her research, Gabrielle is a strong advocate for reform in these areas, most recently working on the need to introduce an independent complaints handling procedure for the federal judiciary and towards the constitutional enshrinement of a First Nations voice. Gabrielle is the director of the Judiciary Project at the Gilbin and Tobin Centre of Public Law, the constitutional consultant to the clerk of the Australian House of Representatives and a member of the Indigenous Law Centre. In 2016, she worked as a pro bono constitutional advisor to the Regional Dialogues and the First Nations Constitutional Convention that led to the Uluru Statement from the Heart. 
Thank you, Gabrielle. Thank you um, so much, Catherine. Um, and I'll start today by acknowledging um, the Mawanina people of this land that I'm zooming in from, which is Hobart, um, and pay my respects to their elders and acknowledge and remember the terrible violence of dispossession that occurred here during colonisation in the 19th century. Um, and I'll acknowledge and pay my respects to the Palawa people and their elders of Lotrawita today. I'd also like to acknowledge before I get started that the work that I'm going to um, present today draws from a lot of collective collaborative research that I've been undertaking with colleagues for almost a decade now um, across Australia, including Catherine at the Centre of Public Integrity and colleagues from University of New South Wales, University of Melbourne, Monash and the University of Tasmania. Um, I'm really honoured uh, um, to be following Sir Jonathan Jones talking about the rise of executive power and more specifically executive legislation making in the UK context. Um, and many of the concerns that he has raised are evident in the Australian practice. Although, of course, we do have a slightly different constitutional context, and I'll speak somewhat about that today. Um, this is a topic I've studied now for almost a decade, and I remember back in 2010 when I was writing the first edition of my textbook, Australian Public Law, trying to convince my co-authors that delegated legislation really was fascinating, that its modern use was concerning, and if the doctrine and practice around it was settled, it really shouldn't be. Um, I've argued that we should not just recite the mantra from the Australian High Court's 1931 decision in Dignan's case, that the separation of powers is asymmetrical, that delegation of legislative power is one of the examples of the lack of delineation between the legislature and the executive, that delegation is necessary to allow government to work, and that parliamentary oversight provides us with the safety net to allay all of our concerns. Rather, I think we need to be constantly vigilant against executive attempts to abuse the delegation of legislative power and to avoid oversight and accountability of parliament. Back in 2016, I wrote that Australia's parliamentary scrutiny and control of delegated legislative power has degenerated, given its previous place and name as a world leader. The state of affairs I was referring to back in 2016 was at least, I said, partly attributable to the High Court's orthodox position that the delegation of legislative power um, was pretty much unconstrained. I argued in that paper that it might be time for the High Court to revisit the carte blanche approach to delegation of legislative power that has followed the decision in Dignan, either by picking up on some of the limits hinted at by Justices Dixon and Evatt in that case, um, or by developing new jurisprudence founded on the responsibility of Parliament for scrutinising the executive. I argued that if the High Court would step into this space, that a constitutional limit on the delegation of legislative power might provide a backstop that would help Parliament in its scrutinising role with democratic rule of law and individual rights benefits. Now, it's not my intention today to dwell on that constitutional argument. What I want to talk about rather is the concerns that motivated me making that argument and the fact that since 2016 they have not gone away. Indeed, they've been exacerbated. And this has all been in the face of ongoing and valiant attempts by the Senate Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee, formerly known um, as the Senate's uh, Regulations and Ordinances Committee, to seek changes to current parliamentary scrutiny regime to provide more meaningful, more robust and more comprehensive oversight. Back in 2016, what's interesting is the examples I was drawing upon were largely drawn from the migration space, with executive lawmaking having serious effects on the lives of people seeking to come to Australia with little parliamentary oversight, and in some cases, directly contrary to Parliament's expressed intentions. But since publishing that work in 2016, there has been a number of developments that have increased public awareness, interest and concern about levels of delegated legislative power and the transparency and oversight of it. So today I'm going to, uh, like Jonathan did, hone in on two areas. First, the response to the COVID-19 pandemic and second, ministerial grants, government spending. Turning first then to COVID. Now, as with Jonathan, I absolutely understand that governments and parliaments need to be able to respond quickly in emergency situations. They need to be able to protect individuals, communities from threats such as a public health pandemic. 
Indeed, one of the acknowledged reasons as to why a legislature may need to delegate lawmaking powers to the executive is that in times of urgency and emergency, the government may need to respond rapidly as a crisis unfolds. But Parliament should not, leaving to one side the question of whether it cannot under the Constitution, just leaving that to the side for the moment, Parliament should not abdicate itself of its lawmaking power through wide delegations with no oversight, even during emergencies. Now, in most instances, the subordinate legislation frameworks of the Australian jurisdictions provide a system whereby delegated legislative instruments are laid before the Houses of Parliament, they're scrutinised according to a set of agreed principles by a parliamentary committee, which is known as technical scrutiny, although this scrutiny often includes substantive concepts such as basic rights. Instruments are subject to disallowance by one of the houses and subject to mandatory sunsetting provisions. At the federal level, this regime is predominantly provided for in the Legislation Act of 2003. Now that act is currently under review and I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. But what we've seen in the case of emergency delegated lawmaking responding to the COVID-19 pandemic is that these frameworks have not operated for a variety of reasons. In the interest of time today, I'm going to focus on what has happened at the federal level, although um, I readily acknowledge that the states have been a very important vanguard in many senses in relation to the pandemic. Um, and of course, Victoria is currently debating um, an attempt to introduce new pandemic specific responses, um, including parliamentary oversight. Um, and so the states are very much a, um, uh, an important part of this discussion. So at the Commonwealth level, the Senate and its committees have responded to the COVID-19 crisis in two key ways. The first is, in, is to establish a select committee on the government's COVID-19 response, which did not look exclusively at this question we're talking about tonight, delegated instruments, but rather it had a broader remit looking at the federal government's response to the crisis. The Senate Standing Committee on Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation has indicated that while it was supportive of establishing such committees, indeed it recommended it that this happen, it warned they do not replace technical parliamentary oversight of delegated legislation. So the second Senate response was by the Standing Committee on Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation itself which in April 2020 announced it would be continuing to sit during the parliamentary suspension during the pandemic, and also that it was going to take on its um, responsibility of publishing all the COVID-19 related instruments on its website, even if these instruments did not fall within their scrutiny jurisdiction. And many of these instruments did not fall within the scrutiny jurisdiction of the Senate committee. That's because many of them are made under the Biosecurity Act of 2015. Part two, division two of that act enables a declaration of a human biosecurity emergency. That declaration is exempt from disallowance and scrutiny by the committee. Once a declaration is in place, the federal health minister can make any determination or direction needed to deal with the biosecurity problem for a period of up to three months. These um, directions can go so far as to override any other law, that is the Henry VIII clauses as we refer to them. They are not subject to disallowance or scrutiny by parliament, but non-compliance with the determination or direction can lead to up to five years imprisonment. So in 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, the Senate committee embarked upon its own inquiry into the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight and including the grounds on which exemptions are appropriate. The committee's decision to do this um, was informed by a range of matters. Yes, it was the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic, but it was also the, the increased volume of delegated legislation that had become exempted from parliamentary scrutiny and disallowance, and the finding of the committee's previous inquiry back in 2019 that this was a concern. In December 2020, the committee released a special interim report dealing specifically with the exemption of instruments during the COVID-19 crisis. And it made a number of recommendations that would increase parliamentary scrutiny of government action in its ongoing COVID-19 response. That report found that between January and July of 2020, approximately 20% 20 of the then 249 pieces of delegated legislation made in response to COVID were exempt from disallowance by the parliament and therefore scrutiny by the committee. 
That included 27 instruments under the Biosecurity Act of 2015 and six instruments that allocated a total of $2.13 billion of public funds um, uh, to assist the government's response to COVID. So the committee made a number of important recommendations that while they were in the specific context of responding to COVID, they do provide broader points of reflection in relation to the use and accountability of delegated lawmaking powers. Let's just highlight a few of those recommendations for now. First, the committee recommended that the parliament needed to give more consideration to exemptions from disallowance at the time enabling provisions are being considered. Second, the committee recommended that delegated legislation made in times of emergency is subject to disallowance where it can be used to override or modify primary legislation. That is, it needs to be subject to disallowance if it amounts to a Henry VIII clause or where it triggers or is a precondition to the imposition of custodial penalties or any other measure which restricts personal rights and liberties. Third, the committee recommended that the Senate amend the standing order that sets its terms of reference to ensure that all delegated legislation made during times of emergency is referred to the committee, regardless of whether it is able to be disallowed. In June this year, the Senate did this, and I'll return to this in a moment. And finally, fourthly, the committee also recommended a number of the provisions of the Biosecurity Act that provide an exemption from disallowance and scrutiny were made subject to disallowance. Now, following the scrutiny of Delegated Legislation's committee's report and pursuant to one of its recommendations, another Senate committee, the Scrutiny of Bills Committee, reviewed the exemption from disallowance of instruments under the Biosecurity Act. Now, it raised concerns it raised similar concerns, citing amongst other examples, the India travel ban instrument as the basis of these and its impact on personal rights and liberties. That committee endorsed the position of the scrutiny of delegated legislation committee and noted that the mere fact that a direction may be based on scientific or um, technical grounds should not be in and of itself enough to exempt something from parliamentary disallowance. And further, the committee rejected the need for urgency as a sufficient justification for the removal of the ordinary parliamentary disallowance process, noting that disallowance doesn't prevent the government from taking immediate and decisive action. It was just last week, 18th of November, almost a year after the committee delivered its interim report, that the government responded to its recommendations. Um, let me pull out three key parts to that response. First, is that in, a, in relation to a number of matters, the government simply noted that it's a matter for the parliament the, the, as to the ultimate decision as to whether or not to exempt an instrument from the disallowance regime. The government asserted that the parliament should consider exemptions from disallowance on a case by case basis in light of the circumstances um, and the context uh, in which it's being made. Now, this is all well and good, of course, but we know that Parliament responds to the legislation that's put before it, that often these pieces of legislation are very large, they're very complex, and they're debated in expedited timeframes. While it is, of course, the Parliament's final responsibility to accept whether a provision exempting instruments from disallowance is okay, they're going to be heavily influenced and informed by this in how the government initially drafts the legislative regime and its justification and its responses to parliamentary scrutinies in relation to matters such as provision seeking exemptions from disallowance. Second, the government batted away a lot of the committee's concerns and recommendations on the basis that they would be considered during a currently underway statutory review review of the Legislation Act of 2003, which, as I said, contains most of the parliamentary oversight regime for delegated legislation. Now, not many people have heard of this review. Indeed, I hadn't heard of this review until I read the government's response. It was announced, or should I say softly whispered, earlier in November. Submissions are due on the 8th of December, just weeks away. It is not a widely advertised inquiry. It is a very important one. And I can encourage you now, if you have any interest in these matters, to look at it and consider making a submission. 
The third part of the government's response to look at is that the government refused to accept the recommendation that instruments under the Biosecurity Act should be made disallowable and should be subject to scrutiny. Despite the rejection of this justification by two different Senate committees, the government simply continued to assert that an exemption from disallowance was required as the decisions relied on scientific and technical advice and also was required to allow the government to act with urgency and citizens to act with certainty. There was no engagement with the dismissal of these arguments by the two bipartisan Senate committees, just a continued assertion of the original basis for the claims. On the 16th of March this year, the Senate Standing Committee on the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation tabled its final report of its inquiry into these matters. Its recommendations were aimed at the Parliament reasserting its constitutionally established role in overseeing the passage of legislation, um, including delegated legislation. It was highly critical of the current practices of exempting instruments from disallowance and through that parliamentary scrutiny without sufficient justification being provided to warrant this. It was highly critical of the mechanism in the current Legislation Act that allows for exemption from disallowance to be done by delegated instrument. It recommended that exemptions must be done in primary legislation. In response to this report, the Senate in June adopted three of its recommendations. First of all, it passed a resolution emphasising the importance of disallowance and sunsetting of delegated legislation, reasserting the constitutional responsibility of the parliament for oversight of delegated legislation. Secondly, the Senate ordered the Attorney General to lay before the House by the end of August a statement explaining the rationale for all of the instruments exempted from disallowance by regulation under the Legislation Act, setting out the exceptional circumstances that the government um, uh, said justified each of these exemptions. Now, in, in June, the Senate made the order, and on the 27th of August, the Attorney General tabled her response. She indicated in her response that given the regulations under the Legislation Act were already considered by Parliament, and had already been subject to scrutiny and disallowance on more than one occasion, there was no constitutional requirement for the government or the parliament to reconsider their rationales and justifications. So her response simply restates rather than reevaluates rationales and justifications. Um, she also asserted that any further um, re-evaluation and restate um, uh, of, of the justification would be too much of an administrative burden on the government at a time when government priorities and resources needed to be elsewhere. Foreshadowing the government's response that I've just referred to in relation to the committee's um, uh, interim report, she said that the government and the committee differ in their interpretation of what constitutes exceptional circumstances, but it is the parliament that ultimately decides whether to delegate a power to enact legislation and whether instruments made pursuant to such a power are exempt from disallowance. What is perhaps most frustrating when you read this response is that rather than engaging with the views and arguments of the committee about justifications from, for exemptions from disallowance, the response is simply a restatement, a copy and paste of the government's original reasons for seeking exemptions. Uh, indeed, as I said, it's largely a copy and paste drawing on previously tabled explanatory memoranda for the regulations. So coming back to the Senate's um, response to the final committee report, the third thing the Senate did was amended the terms of reference for the scrutiny of delegated legislation committee um, in relation to exemptions from sunsetting and instruments that amend or modify the operation of primary legislation, Henry VIII clauses. And also, this is really um, a really big step, it amended the terms of reference to allow the committee to scrutinise instruments that are exempt from disallowance. So no longer does exemption from disallowance mean they'll be exempted from scrutiny by the committee. The Senate has responded to this final report in its June, June resolutions, but the government has not yet responded. All right. So moving from the COVID-19 um, government uh, response, I'm now going to look at the issue of government grants. 
So the second issue I want to raise is the public controversy over the misallocation of government grants, good old fashioned pork barrelling, if you will. Now, of course, this has most recently been in our consciousness at the state level over the Daryl Maguire induced grant approvals by the then New South Wales Treasurer and now former Premier Gladys Berejiklian. But before then, there was the sports rorts affair at the federal level, as well as others, such as the car park rorts affair. But let's focus in on the sports rorts affair for just a moment. This scandal was revealed in January 2020 when the Australian National Audit Office and a really big shout out to the audit office on this and other um, scrutiny and accountability matters that they have been bringing to light over the last few years. The office's investigation into the community sport infrastructure program. This investigation revealed that the award of grant funding was not informed by appropriate assessment processes and sound advice, and that the successful applications were not those that had been assessed as the most meritorious in terms of published program guidelines, but rather had been made in political advantageous electorates. Now, the federal level is slightly more complicated than the state level because there is an Australian High Court decision of 2012 in the National School Chaplaincy case or Williams and the Commonwealth, which requires, with very few exceptions, federal government spending programs to have express statutory legislative authorization. In 2012, the High Court developed this requirement because it said it would ensure Parliament was be able to review and scrutinise government expenditure of public monies. Further, because statutory authorization would require a connection back to a federal head of power, federal jurisdiction, um, the Commonwealth would not be able to encroach on the careful division of powers between um, the federal and the state levels through its spending programs. Now, in response to the 2012 case, the Commonwealth enacted Section 32B of what is now called the Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Act of 1997. This provision was, in, was going to authorise future executive um, expenditure programs. It gave the Commonwealth power to vary or administer funding arrangements and grants that were specified in regulations. That is, Parliament delegated back to the executive the power to authorise its own spending. Parliament also inserted a schedule into the regulations that at that time listed over 400 funding programs and they have subsequently been amended and added to by regulation. Now there is a real and as yet untested constitutional question about whether this mechanism an executive authorisation of executive expenditure through delegated legislation meets the constitutional requirements that the High Court was referring to in the Williams case. But there are also other constitutional questions, one of which is directly raised by the sports rot scandal. In addition to the questions that the scandal raises about political and government interference and corruption and allocation of money in accordance with fair processes and merits-based criteria, and whether the current system of legal accountability me mechanisms are sufficient to redress this. But let's focus in on this constitutional question. This is a question that turns on whether the federal government grants are being made within federal power. That is, they are supported by what we call the federal heads of power. Or are they properly matters that are left to the local and state governments? Looking just at the sports rorts affair, the expenditures were authorised by the Australian Sports Commission Act. And it would seem that some of the aspects of the funding might fall within federal parliament's remit particularly in relation to establishing, for example, a National Institute for Sport in the ACT, but there are a large number of very locally focused grants that would not. The Senate's Regulations and Ordinances Committee, now the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee, had been pushing the government on these points, that is, had been exercising its responsible parliamentary oversight role since the Williams decision was handed down in 2012. But again, we see a largely unsatisfactory government response. In 2019, the committee recommended that all authorizations of expenditure under the Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Act and the Industry Research Development Act be subject to affirmative resolution, res, um, uh, resolution procedures. That suggestion was not taken up. Um, 
following amendments to its terms of reference in 2019, the Senate committee um, is now able to consider whether a delegated instrument appears to be supported by a constitutional head of legislative power and is otherwise constitutionally valid. The committee has now developed a dedicated set of guidelines for scrutinising instruments authorising expenditure under these pieces of legislation. And the committee is concerned with constitutional authority for expenditure, whether the, um, those likely to be affected by the instrument were adequately consulted, the availability of merits review, and ins otherwise ensuring parliamentary oversight. Despite the tenacity of the committee on this question, <coughs> sorry, including the change in its terms of reference by the Senate, the adoption of these new guidelines and frequent backwards and forwards between the committee and government departments and ministers on these issues, there still remains significant numbers of programs that are approved with tenuous connections to federal heads of power. Too often, the government is simply reasserting its initial responses to the issues and not properly engaging with the committee's concerns. As Professor Anne Toomey has written, too often in relation to government expenditure, despite the efforts of the High Court and the scrutiny of delegated legislation committee, it would seem, quote, the constitution is ignored on the basis that no one with the legal standing to do so is likely to challenge the constitutional validity of these grants. This is dressed up in government circles as addressing constitutional risks. It really means breaching the constitution because we are confident we can get away with it, unquote. So what to say in conclusion? I have four points that I hope will bring some of this home. First of all, COVID-19 revealed a number of shortfalls in relation to the oversight of delegated legislative powers across the jurisdictions in Australia. As we start to look beyond the immediate response to the current pandemic, it's time to review these shortfalls and learn some of these lessons. Some of them will better prepare us for a more transparent, more scrutinised and therefore stronger government response to a future pandemic. Many of them are more broadly relevant and will just improve the parliamentary scrutiny in the, in the face of expansion of delegated legislative power. Secondly, the Senate Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee and the Scrutiny of Bills Committee are doing really gallant work in trying to reassert Parliament's role in overseeing delegated legislative power, whether that be in relation to the COVID-19 response or the supervision of delegated authorisation of government expenditure. These are cross-party committees. The recommendations that are coming out of them are bipartisan. It is impressive work. It is important work. It is detailed work. And the Senate is largely supporting them. The government is not. Thirdly, there is currently a review of the Legislation Act of 2003. It's looking at important issues, including exempting delegated legislation from disallowance and from scrutiny. Its timeframe is tight, but it, um, it is a review that picks up many of the concerns that have been previously ventilated, ventilated by the Senate committees. The government hasn't really publicised this review. I am publicising it at again now. And finally, I'm going to end where I started back in 2016, that maybe in Australia, it's time to revisit the constitutional position in relation to the delegation of legislative power. While I doubt that any future constitutional limit would, would amount to a robust judicial constitutional scrutiny, it's more likely to be at the edges of abdication of parliamentary obligations, it might be able to provide additional heft to a Senate and its committees currently coming up against government stonewalls in their attempts to increase parliamentary oversight. It would be a sort of Damocles dangling over their heads, if you will. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. The two case studies that you've used really effectively highlight the, the urgent need for reform and what you've explained about the government's response to calls from the Senate Committee for that reform is really quite alarming. We've had some interesting questions come in from the audience and it would be great with our remaining time to hear your thoughts and Jonathan's thoughts on some of those questions. Um, I'd like to begin with one, it's actually the one most recently arrived in the Q&A from Peter Wilkins, but I think it's particularly pertinent given what the, you know, the, the legislation that's being debated in Victoria at the moment. Um, and so Peter Wilkins asks, what reasons warrant statutory instruments from being structured to prevent scrutiny and disallowance by parliament? 
where this approach relates to responding to emergencies and rescinding them would undermine the responses involved without being able to simultaneously create alternative responses, could the bars on scrutiny and disallowance be limited in time or other relevant circumstances? Gabrielle, perhaps I'll start with you, your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, so it's interesting. It's a very, very good question. And the Senate Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee back in 2019 asked the government to provide a list of reasons that warranted exemption from disallowance and scrutiny. Now, there is um, a list, if you dig into some of those documents, the Attorney General Department submission to the second Senate committee inquiry that I was referring to does provide a list of 12 instances in which um, the government believes there are um, justified exemptions from disallowance and scrutiny, um, reliance on technical um, uh, and scientific advice being one, and um, responding to times, uh, responding with urgency in times of emergency being another. Um, now, I made a submission to that inquiry, and my views are. Uh, uh, together with Professor George Williams and uh, Associate Professor Janina Bow at UNSW were different from that of the Attorney General's Department, saying that um, these are not reasons that would justify exemption from disallowance, that given disallowance operates in Australia prospectively from the point of time, at, the time at which disallowance motion occurs, not retrospectively, um, the concerns are around um, the government being able to respond with urgency um, uh, uh, can still be met. Um, the idea that relying on technical and scientific advice would mean that parliament should be dealt out of the game really, I think, uh, doesn't uh, um, uh, come to grips with the fact that how much um, technical and expert uh, advice that Parliament needs to receive in passing um, primary legislation. We submitted that there should be three circumstances in which exemption um, would occur, where there were other ways of ensuring scrutiny, for example, um, an affirmative resolution procedure, as occurs in some instances in the UK, I understand, Jonathan. Um, uh, now, the... Um, as I said, the government asserted that there still remain 12, and its most recent responses in August um, indicate that they're still asserting that all of those exemptions um, uh, remain valid um, reasons. Thank you, Gabriel. Jonathan, would you like to add anything to that? I think you're muted, Jonathan. Sorry, classic error. It's still very early. Um, the, the, I think we share many of the same um, sort of concerns and, and perspectives. I mean, the, the main difference here, of course, is that we have no overarching codified constitutional controls on any of this. So in the end, it is for Parliament to decide in any case, first of all, what powers it grants the executive, and secondly, what levels of scrutiny it um, requires. Um, so that's a judgment that is made in the legislation at the time the powers are granted. And very often what will happen, particularly on emergency legislation, is that then a measure of discretion is allowed to the minister exercising the power to decide whether, for example, the test of urgency is met and therefore that only limited scrutiny should apply. So there are various levels at which this judgment is made. I have suggested, because we don't have a constitution, that can deal with this. Um, but nonetheless, we should try and codify and tighten up some of these tests so that um, very wide powers, for example, powers to amend primary legislation should be granted only in very specific circumstances. Secondly, that um, certain categories of instruments should, be, should require a debate and a vote, and that some should even be amendable, as I've mentioned. Um, and, and, um, and also, again, this point, that the circumstances in which instruments could be made with no prior scrutiny <clears throat> should be defined in the narrowest possible way. Now, those are all quite difficult things to define objectively, but I think we've got a problem and therefore we should have a go. In our case, I suggested that should be done by an act of parliament, by a statutory instruments act. We have a statutory instruments act that does a bit of this, but it's very, it's very old and it isn't really suitable for the, the situations that, that Kerry and I have been describing. So I'm suggesting that we should have a new Statutory Instruments Act, which will not be entrenched uh, you know, constitutionally, that itself could always be overridden by a future act. But nonetheless, we should have a go at setting some tests 
but frankly do constrain the executive's hand simply to decide that something is urgent and simply to opt for the minimal level of scrutiny. That's, that, I think, is the problem that we're both identifying. Okay. Thank you both. We have another very good question. This is um, from someone anonymous in our audience. They've indicated that they were very interested, Jonathan, in what you spoke about regarding the increasing blurring between guidance materials and laws. And they have um, noted that increasingly, when someone contacts a government department, public servants are likely to cite guidelines rather than acts or instruments. In Australia, legislative instruments are at least disallowable, while guidelines are not. It, and they've said it seems that not only is the executive relying more on delegated legislation over primary legislation, but now there is a movement away from relying on delegated instruments for providing details, which is being taken care of by guidance and other soft instruments. Uh, what reforms would you, Jonathan, first suggest to address this issue? Well, I, again, I completely agree with the analysis of the problem. Um, and I'm not the only one. I mentioned one, one of our um, House of Commons committees, the Justice Committee, has picked up on the same thing, particularly in the case where you're talking about criminal offences. Um, and lots of criminal offences were created by the COVID legislation in particular. Um, and it's simply not satisfactory that, that where you're subjecting somebody to the possibility of criminal sanction, the law is unclear or there is confusion between guidance and law. Only the law can determine the text of the law can determine whether somebody is guilty for criminal offence. And the Justice Committee has suggested simply, I mean, again, there's no magic to this, that, that there should be greater clarity, that when government is issuing guidance, it should be clear that it is only guidance. It should be clear about the distinction between guidance and the law. And to go back to a point I made earlier, um, it should be very clear where the law can be found. So there should be a signpost to the text of the law itself. Um, so those things, it's partly a cultural issue here, that, that, that it goes to police forces, that the police themselves, if they're going to be enforcing the law, they need to be clear that they're acting on the basis of the legislation, not a guidance document. And then you won't have the other problem I touched on, which is prosecutions going wrong. So there's a, there's a set of behavioural issues, there are a set of um, cultural issues, but in the end, what we need is clarity. Um, irrespective of what the law says, we need to be clear about what is the law, and, and although guidance may be helpful, um, there needs to be clarity about the status of the guidance and, and where it is merely adding to or, or supplementing the, the law itself. Thank you. Gabrielle, would you like to add your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, um, I'll just add a few comments, but Jonathan has covered up on most of them. It's a, it's a really excellent um, question and um, the way in which it's framed in that question is, is, is goes straight to the heart of it. And, you know, we've seen guidance documents in Australia um, for a very long time. Um, you know, I remember when I was in law school scratching my head about what was the status of these tax office rulings that they publish on the website. They're not uh, judicial rulings, they're not interpretations of the, the tax act, they're just an indication of how the government intends to interpret the legislation when you interact with that department. Now there is, as Jonathan said, there's benefits to that in terms of um, transparency and um, an element of sort of certainty and consistency that, 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 that might come from those types of guidance documents. But what is really concerning is the, um, the lack of indication about the status of those documents um, and that it can they can be relied upon um, uh, by those working in departments uh, in a way that makes it um, appear to individuals engaging with government that they have um, some sort of legal status um, and that is the real concern. The concern isn't that there are guidelines and uh, an indication of how the government is likely to, in, to, to respond um, to particular um, issues. The, the, the concern is um, the potential status confusion um, uh, about the fact that this is the government's interpretation of its mandate um, and that ultimately it's not for the government to finally determine uh, its mandate, its responsibility its obligations, that that is open to challenge um, and can be done uh, by individuals if they disagree with that interpretation. Um, so I think that's the, 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 the issue. Um, and I know that one of my colleagues um, at UNSW, um, uh, Lisa Burton Crawford, has been looking at this issue in relation to um, uh, hyper legislation and helping uh, trying to understand um, instances where there is such a, a volume and complexity of legislation and the issues of guidance notes in um, relation to um, that uh, um, uh, increasing phenomenon. Thank you. 
Thank you, Gabrielle. We have two remaining questions. One Gabrielle has answered in the chat. So I hope the asker of that question has seen the answer that Gabrielle has put in there for you. Um, and the remaining question comes from Warwick Smith, who has asked, um, how can the distinction between directional statutory principles, strategic objects and high level process aspects and operational procedures and instructions that need to be adaptable to changing circumstances and stakeholder needs best be managed? He's noted that more legal prescription really achieves better outcomes with diverse interests and communities and changing circumstances over time. Gabriel, perhaps do you have any comment on, on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's the um, the, the ever challenging um, question about uh, should legislation be prescribing uh, principles or rules? So the the, the, the the debate and the necessary balance between principles that allow for adaptation, um, response to circumstances that may not have been uh, anticipated at the time, and the need for rules to prescribe with um, certainty and pre um, precision. Um, uh, you know, we see it in relation to the delegated legislation context to sort of bring it back to what we've been talking to throughout the seminar. We see it in relation to um, some of the incredibly broad um, delegations of legislative power in primary instruments. Um, and uh, what I've been advocating for a long time is that, that, that these are too far on the side of giving the executive the ability to fill in any possible gap that may exist, um, uh, potentially overriding and um, uh, uh, primary legislation, um, and that there needs to be greater prescription in relation to the delegation of executive um, lawmaking. The parliament needs to anticipate major policy choices that might be involved in relation to um, uh, those uh, delegated powers and provide more prescription. Um, uh, you know, probably not going so far along the lines of being uh, prescribed individual uh, circumstances, um, but what we have in so many instruments is an extremely broad um, uh, delegated legislative power. Um, we're advocating for more prescription, probably not going down the rule, the, 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 the path of rules for every possible um, uh, anticipated exercise of that power, getting that balance right between principles and rules. Jonathan, would you like to add anything to that? Well, there's not, not very much to add. I think that this is exactly the, the point that, that has existed really as long as we've had secondary legislation is this tension between the convenience of being able to uh, legislate quickly and conveniently for matters of detail or um, technical procedural issues whilst leaving to parliament, leaving to the, the primary legislature, issues of policy and you know, strategic issues, but drawing a line between those things is admittedly very hard. Um, all, I've, all I'm saying is that I think the, the time has come where we've gone too far one way and we should have a go at redrawing the limits, accepting that it is difficult. And part of this is if you are giving wide powers, and sometimes it may be right and necessary to give wide powers, those powers should be subject to enhanced scrutiny. That should be the price of the executive getting wide powers is that they are themselves then properly scrutinized. So difficult though it is to draw these boundaries, some constitutions do try. The Irish constitution, I think, has some kind of distinction between what's proper for primary legislation and what can be delegated, but they are difficult judgments. But I think what we're both saying is that things have gone too far one way and we should have a go at redrawing the line. Okay. All right, look, thank you both. As I'm aware, we're already running well and truly over time. We'll need to bring this evening's event now to a close. But thank you so much, Jonathan and Gabrielle, for a really stimulating discussion, as well as to all of you who have joined us tonight. You can see more about the Centre's work at our website and make sure that you sign up to our mailing list if you would like to receive future research updates and event invitations. Thanks very much, everybody. Good night.